PVSM, AVSM, VM, ADC, Chief of Air Staff. The Air Chief Marshal has commanded a frontline fighter squadron and two important fighter bases. Some of his notable assignments include Assistant Chief of the Air Staff, Air Defense, Assistant Chief of the Air Staff, Personal Officers, and Deputy Chief of the Air Staff, where he spearheaded several major procurement cases for the IAF. He later was Air Officer Commanding in Chief of Western Air Command and Vice Chief of the Air Staff before taking over as Chief of the Air Staff on 30th September 21. Ladies and gentlemen, the future of war is a hybrid. We've got with us the Chief of Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Vivekram Chaudhary. As I mentioned, the future of war is a hybrid. Traditional domains of war fighting today merge with evolving technologies. To cater to these evolving threats, the Indian Air Force is adapting rapidly, and in the cockpit to oversee it all is the Chief of Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Vivekram Chaudhary. This image that you see on the screen of Air Chief Marshal V. R. Chaudhary flying the indigenous LCA Tejas truly encapsulates a new made in India era for the Indian Air Force under his command. Commissioned into the fighter stream of the Indian Air Force on the 29th of December 1982, Air Chief Marshal Chaudhary has over 3,800 flight hours, has been a pioneering member of the Indian Air Force's Surya Kiran aerobatic display team, and was in active service during Operation Meghdut, the operation that ensured India's presence on the Siachen Glacier. I'd like to now invite Air Chief Marshal V. R. Chaudhary to address us on the theme, Time of Transformation, the Sky is Ours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you, Rini, for that kind introduction. And um, thank you very much for inviting me to deliver the summit keynote address and talk about the trajectory of the nation in the next 25 years, and in the Indian Air Force in particular. <clears throat> so, excuse me. Let me begin by what the Prime Minister had quoted just a few days ago. I need to read this. He said, we have less time, but immense capabilities. We have difficult targets, but great courage. We have the goal to climb the mountains, but we will transcend even the skies. Very appropriate for today's theme. <laughs> Let me begin by taking you all back as a flashback to 25 years prior to this day. 1998, I was a young pilot in a combat frontline combat squadron, but where were we as a nation in 1998? The Pokhran blasts had just taken place. India, the, as a country, was badly sanctioned. Mobile connectivity was a distant dream. All of us were still using dial-up telephones. I'm sure most of you would have still relied on the good old inland letters and postcards to communicate with each other. The PSLV rockets were just launched a few years prior to that. India's GDP was a little above $400 billion. This is where we need to realize where we were 25 years ago. If we allow us to comprehend, this will allow us to comprehend the kind of leap that is going to take place in the coming 25 years. Not to forget, we are also all 25 years older, but we have adapted to this technology. Today, I'm sure all of us in all of our households, from the grandparents to the grandchild, everybody is on a common WhatsApp group. Everybody has learned how to use technology. So I'm confident that in the coming 25 years, or when India celebrates its 100 years of independence, everybody, the whole nation, will be technologically savvy. The fact that technology grows exponentially and not linearly should not be lost on us. What we will see that in the next 25 years, there will definitely be greater growth the contours of which are going to be quite difficult to predict at this stage. When our nation completes 100 years of independence, we would be looking at a very different India. 
possibly one of the largest economies in the world, possibly a leader in many fields, but definitely a power to reckon with. And when I use these words, a power to reckon with, what are the attributes that go behind this statement to say that India is a power to reckon with? One such attribute, I would say, is to be able to reach a dominant position characterized by the ability to exert influence or project power across the globe. This can be done through a combination of all the means at the hands of the government, the economic, the political, the diplomatic heft, the cultural well-being, the soft power, all these are engines which are going to drive us towards reaching a position where we are a country to reckon with. We already are the fifth largest economy, galloping towards being the third largest in the coming decade. We also have now reached the distinction of being the most populous nation in the world. What we have to understand is, interestingly, this demographic dividend opportunity, which began from the year 2005 or 6 and go on till 2055 or 56, this 50 years is going to see that the, our nation will have the largest, youngest population in the world. This bulge in the working class population is something that we need to capitalize on and, and exploit to the fullest. Our economic progress, political stability, diplomatic deafness, and all this has put us on the center stage in world affairs. Added to this, definitely, is the combined military might of the nation. Today, the Indian Army is the fourth, sorry, is the eighth, uh, the second largest army in the world. The Indian Navy is the eighth largest Navy. The Indian Air Force is the fourth largest Air Force in the world. Combined, we form a very potent force that can definitely chart the future of this nation in the next 25 years. The Indian Air Force, I will now speak particularly about, has just completed 90 years of existence. It is the youngest of the service. And as we move towards celebrating our centenary 10 years from today, we need to transform into one of the most modern air and space forces. That is my vision and the dream. The Indian Air Force, like any other Air Force, is a very highly technological and capital intensive service. And it will always mirror the trajectory of the nation as a whole. We have to keep this in mind, that apart from probably the development of the semiconductors or the chip, no other field has seen so much development in the last 100 years. Mind you, aviation came into being only in 1903, in the first flight of the Wright brothers. So in the 100 or 120 years that have gone by of aviation history, the kind of transformation we have seen is only seen, like I said, in the semiconductor industry. Evolution has taken place from small biplanes to now exploitation of space in all its domains. So this is just a glimpse of things that have happened and what we can expect in the future. Where is the challenge going to be? In my opinion, the challenge is going to lie in indigenous development, design, research and production of these capabilities that will grant, that will take us into the um, 100th year of the Indian Air Force's existence. For example, development of new generation aircraft, weapon systems, radars. This will all require an all of an all of nation approach. No single entity will be able to achieve what we desire to possess. The capability that we, we are looking forward to in the next 25 years it has to be an all-of-nation approach. We need to focus on research and development with the aim to manufacture on our own, rather than mere indigenization of a few foreign uh, or a few imported components. The focus has to remain on ability to design, develop, and manufacture in our country. And in this respect, I must say that the government has taken uh, large steps in supporting the Indian companies and academia with the necessary policy formulation and by providing a conducive environment. I have no doubt in my mind that our industry, MSMEs and the academia will give full impetus in realizing our dream of having strategic autonomy or Atmanirbharta in defense production. 
besides the <coughs> future uh, technologies, we also need to ensure that we have innovative means of sustaining, maintaining, and upgrading what we possess today. Remember that most of the platforms, to give you an example, we have three aircraft in our inventory, the HS-748 Avro, the MiG-21, and the Chetak helicopter. All of them have finished 60 years of service to the nation. So what we have to understand is that any fleet or any system that we induct would probably have a longevity of 50 years in service. So when we look at these systems and what we already possess, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we continuously need to upgrade so as to be able to, uh, to extract the best out of these platforms. Developments in technology will ensure that Indian defense manufacturers will have to play ball. And what Indian defense manufacturers will produce will determine the inventory and the capability of the Indian Air Force in 2047. We are, we are not only looking at indigenous uh, or not only looking at preventing our adversaries from having an asymmetric edge over us, but we are also looking at developing our own asymmetry in, uh, you know, across all the domains. In the last few decades, we have seen that any technological advancement in any field led to incremental change in our capability. For example, in the aviation industry, any technology that was developed resulted in little better accuracy of weapons, little longer range, little longer endurance of platforms, and so on. But today's technology, the way it is galloping, with the help of artificial intelligence, robotics, battlefield of things, internet of things, the changes that are going to take place are not going to be incremental, not delta changes. They are going to be huge. This application will, will have the potential to completely transform the way we fight and win future wars. While it has always been heartening to see that our indigenous defense capability is able to meet up with our present demands, we have to ensure that they imbibe and infuse these technologies in all the future productions. I, the point about future wars was alluded to by some of the previous speakers, that future wars are going to be hybrid in nature. I'm sure all of us understand that it is not going to be purely kinetic wars that we're talking about. Any conflict in future will be spread across multiple domains, from the, what we say, the conventional to the subconventional, from the kinetic to the non-kinetic, from the lethal to the non-lethal. So there are multiple domains that we need to simultaneously look at and keep addressing when we look at the future of the Air Force. This uh, development in all these arenas is quite visible to us when we analyze the ongoing conflict in Europe. So we need to accept the fact, firstly, that tomorrow's wars cannot be fought with yesterday's technology or yesterday's mindsets. Very important to keep changing our mindsets as fast as the technology develops. Here I would like to allude upon the capability of air power. Being a man in blue, heading the Indian Air Force, I think it is important that we discuss what air power can bring to the table. What we need to understand is that air power has the unique capability not only to deter or defend the nation, but also to punish the adversary when required. It is even at the lower end of spectrum, whether it is no war, no peace situation, or purely peacetime situations, uh, air power will con continue to contribute very effectively to the, um, in pursuit of the national objectives. We have all seen the Indian Air Force's response to certain situations in the last few years. We were the first to launch an aircraft to Wuhan to bring out our diaspora and Indian students from Wuhan when the COVID pandemic hit. We were the first to undertake extraction of our diaspora from Yemen. We carried out Operation Ganga, which the Minister for Civil Aviation alluded to, one of the largest operations carried out, bringing back our students from the countries which surround Ukraine. We were the first to respond when the earthquake hit Turkey and Syria. Our aircraft were ready to launch six hours after we got the first intimation of the earthquake. Operation Ganga, or today we are launching Operation Kaveri, 
He planned to extricate our nationals from Sudan. So whether it is the COVID response or any HADR, response to any situations of floods, earthquakes, not only in the country, but across the globe, I think we have proven that air power will and will always remain the first responder. And the challenge here is to ensure that we retain our capabilities and develop our capabilities to, to remain in this pole position in the next 25, 30 years. When it comes to the operational side, we need to understand that Indian Air Force has the capability of undertaking not only independent strategic operations, but also operations conducted in conjunction or coordination with the other services and arms of the national um, security apparatus. We clearly understand the requirement to conduct joint planning and joint execution of operations in any future battle. We have recently updated and published the Doctrine for the Indian Air Force, the third edition of the Doctrine for the Indian Air Force, basically to keep it relevant for the kind of conflicts that we anticipate in the coming decades. The next step would be to use the doctrinal aspects, our operational experience, and the trained manpower to develop new concepts of operations and new operational philosophies. We, we are also very cognizant of the fact that no single service can win any war alone. It always has to be a joint effort, and we are fully uh, cognizant of the requirement of contributing in every way of carrying out joint operations. In the fog of any war or battle space, what we have to remember is that the winner is the one who has a clear picture, not only of the disposition of the enemy's forces, but also knowledge to some extent of the intentions of the adversary. How do we get to know the intentions of the adversary? This is one thing which we keep very close to our heart as the chief or as the commander of the forces. People will know through open sources what kind of resources I have got, how many aircraft I have got, where are they deployed, what are the weapons. But what the adversary they will never understand is what are the intentions. What I have in mind, how am I going to apply this power? Here I find that we are able to capitalize on some technologies to be able to read the adversary's mind based on the deployments, based on the patterns they're following, based on the training exercises they carry out. This is a futuristic goal, not only to, to decipher the deployments, but to decipher the, the um, mindset of the adversary's leadership. For this, we have, um, you know, our network-centric capability will form the essence of all this. When we talk about network centricity, there are three basic elements. One is the sensors. The sensors are the radars, the um, any other electro-optical sensors can be ground-based, can be airborne, and so on. Then we have the shooters. Shooters could be manned, unmanned, could be surface-based, air launch, and so on. And in between, we have a decision maker. The idea is to get all of this networked on the same grid. Today, I'm proud to say that we have a fairly robust ground network of which connects all these sensors and shooters. What we look for in the future is to have a similar airborne network and a space-based network, and thereafter integrating all these networks into one common grid, so as to be able to assist the commander or the fielded forces to be able to take decisions based on multiple inputs. Today, the challenge we face is once again the large number of data that we get from the sensors. To be able to process it and take a decision is getting more and more difficult by the day for a human being. Here is where we are looking at artificial intelligence and machine learning to come to our aid. Decision support systems is the need of the hour, and our focus will remain in developing more able, more robust decision support systems that will form the backbone of our networks. Space has also been alluded to by the Honorable Minister of, of State for Space, I think the second talk this morning, and um, there's no denying the fact that space remains the ultimate high ground, and our aspirations are to transform from being a purely Indian Air Force to probably an Indian Air and Space Force in the future. 
development and utilization of all space based assets whether it is for position navigation timekeeping reconnaissance or communication we not only need to exploit the best that is available but we need to keep thinking futuristically to draw you back to uh, a famous author of the 1950s arthur clark in 1951 had predicted what the utilization of space could be we are seeing some of it turning into reality now 70 years down the line i think we need to develop this kind of clairvoyance to be able to determine what we are going to need 50 years from today and start planning for it there is a flip side to this you know easy accessibility to high end technology can give new challenges we have seen the harassment caused by drones in the middle east in the last few years we have seen drones teaming with manned aircraft in the conflict which took place in azerbaijan and armenia we are now seeing armed drones proliferating all over europe in the russian uh, ukrainian conflict so we also have doctrinally included drone usage in our operational philosophy and what we are working towards for the future inductions is not mere induction of drones but teaming them with manned aircraft so in future what we see is that every manned aircraft will have a team of unmanned aircraft going together as a larger formation we have laid out a road map for this kind of technology and um, innovations with the help of the domestic industry and the academia and the process of reequipping retraining and remodeling of the indian air force is well underway so what will be the future contours or roles of the indian air force as we see it the list is rather long but i will dwell upon a few important bullet points number 1 is persistent presence to be able to be be there at the right time at the right place in adequate numbers multi role capability rapid deployment spectrum dominance a very important aspect that generally gets neglected is to be able to dominate across all spectrums of warfare precision targeting rapid innovation for creating asymmetry these are all the unique capabilities that we are looking at this i believe will in the years to come will definitely help in uh, adapting to the changes in the character of war that are taking place uh, another important aspect that we should not lose sight is the man or woman behind the machines i paused at woman because let me make it clear the indian air force is completely gender agnostic when it comes to women at the officers rank and we have um, we have the largest percentage of women officers amongst the three services today uh, but the need of our of the r is to be able to multi skill this manpower that we have got so far our focus has been on straight jacketing their training their branches their trades their qualifications and so on now we have taken big steps in multi talenting or uh, multi skilling these talented youngsters we find that everybody has got the ability to learn more than one skill or one trade and this is what we need to capitalize upon uh, we are cognizant that in future we will be a lean and a mean force capable of handling more than our mere, mere core competency on the whole i think all of you will agree that post the uh, the uh, balakot and other operations we have demonstrated our capability and more importantly the will to be able to respond at a level that we determine which is appropriate for our nation but what is important is that we the men and women in uniform are the cutting edge of this ability of the nation and it is behoves on us to ensure that we keep this cutting edge sharp at all times i'm sure when you think of the indian air force all of you look at fighter aircraft fast jets huge transport airplanes or nimble helicopters i agree this this form the bulk of what we are here for and what we do but what we have to look at for the future is having indigenous platforms we have 
made large steps in inducting the light combat aircraft in its various avatars. We will we have given a full support to the development of the advanced medium combat aircraft. We have inducted the light combat helicopters. We are taking part in development of the multi-role helicopters. The C-295 is going to be manufactured in India. We are going to be part of a huge domestic aviation ecosystem that is coming up now. So apart from looking at just these mere assets of aeroplanes, what generally is not seen is what goes behind these operations. It is not just these uh, platforms which are used for kinetic action. To ensure success of these platforms, there are huge number of enablers or force enhancers that we continue to focus on. I had mentioned about networks. Network is one such thing. What we are looking at is secure communications, which are powered by fifth and sixth generation software-defined radios. We are looking at post-quantum cryptography compatible equipment. We are looking at miniaturized electronic warfare equipment. We are seeking multiple satellite-based or airborne data links, along with significant enhancement of the capability for carrying out continuous and persistent surveillance and recce over the area of interest. All this can be made possible if all the users work in synergy with each, with each other and with the researchers, developers, and the manufacturers. And when I say we, I don't mean the Indian Air Force. I, you know, with the permission of the Army Chief and the Navy Chief, I can say with confidence, when I say we, it is all of us in the armed forces that we have to work together. I, I think the, the topic chosen for this uh, seminar could not have been more apt. Ladies and gentlemen, transformation is an ongoing process. It appears to be ordinary, but when we look at it, transformation in depth, we find that something extraordinary is always taking place. We need to capitalize on what is, what is this little extraordinary thing that is happening. Where can I put my shoulder to it and ensure that that happens at a faster pace and that is what is going to propel us into our 100th year of independence in 2047. On that note, I would like to wish all the participants all the very best of this uh, summit. I'm sure the discussions and brainstorming will produce ideas and concepts that will truly make us a world leader 25 years from today. Thank you and Jai Hind. The entire team of Republic would like to thank uh, Air Chief V.R. Chaudhary for gracing the summit and sharing such important words with us. On that note, Deepthi, it's been a good start and uh, quite sets the tone in the first half of day one of the Republic Summit, the summit we've all been waiting for. And um, three union ministers, defense chiefs, uh, Mr. Uday Kotak, uh, shared their insights on time of transformation. What are the quick takeaways for, for you? Because I'm sure I say that on behalf of every audience member that uh, it has been very enlightening and informative. Absolutely, and I'm just requesting our uh, esteemed uh, guest to please continue to remain seated because we are building towards a very, very fascinating TED Talk next. Uh, we'll just take a few moments. Uh, Talornab is back in the audience. I'm just requesting all of you to be seated, please. It's been, um, I, I think, a massive participation that we've seen now from a lot of our familiar panelists on televisions. You know, we meet them in um, studios usually. It's great. A lot of them are here in person. Uh, Tanvir is here. He's here from a busy, busy Karnataka scheduled. Uh, General Bakshi is also here. Uh, Pradeep Soy is here. Uh, I did see, I think, uh, Lieutenant General Sanjay Kulkarni is up. A lot of them, uh, you know, Soesha. And I think it's very interesting that at meets like these, you get to interact and listen to so many people. Uh, and you realize that TV is such a powerful medium. Yes. The message that we carry, how we connect with our audiences, uh, is so fascinating. Uh, and I think after the break, you know, like they say, after the break, there is so much more, uh, considering it's for the first time that you've had all the service chiefs together on the dais of Republic. I think that's a huge achievement. 
the very fact that you've seen their side, you know, speaking about, uh, like, I, I, what I just loved about a conversation that just concluded is the entire focus and the participation of women uh, yes. in the forces. I see Ordem is back, so let's not waste more time. And thank you once more for your continuous patronage, your patience, uh, ladies and gentlemen. But this patience and this wait is worth the wait, I'll say. And uh, over to Renina. Thank you so much, uh, Deepthi and Suresha. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being so patient. Coming up, we've got a digital tech visionary who believes the future of transformation is homegrown, and in doing so, has changed the game. He is none other than Mr. Sridhar Vimbu. He was building billion dollar businesses in the Silicon Valley in the US but had a vision for building a world-class business right from the villages of India. Here is an image of him when he came to India in the early 2000s, I think, inaugurating one of his early projects back when he was still working in the US. He moved to India a few years ago, and now Mr. Vembu is the founder 